after a long talking about women, I think there is a small space even for the men. And the second, I would like to reassure my colleague, Dr. Ramsey, you are not the only urologist. I am another one urologist. So we are two, all with the gynecologists and endocrinologists. Thank you. So let's start with this article of the, the new journal of the New York Times. It was 1982. I would like to read with you. It was written that uh, infertility was something most men never had to face. Potency and fertility were considered synonymous. So imagine how it was in the past, the situation about male fertility. And any societies, if a marriage was barren, the solution was to get a new wife. So imagine the difficulty of the situation in that period. And when the women was not the cause of the infertility, we just say, the, the causes are unknown. And just 10% of infertility causes were attributed to the man. So the situation was really dramatically. Today, doctors agree that more than 50% depends on men or men and women together. So this is my promise to change this situation. And I would like to present this paper of 2013 that is showing how the situation is completely different in 40 years, because in 2013, this uh, Q8 group is talking about spur parameters, even to considerate good health and longevity. So from thinking that fertility and potency are the same thing, we arrive in 2013 in, in, in uh, which we could speculate that maybe the sperm, it can be even maybe something that uh, can give us a parameters of our health and longevity. There are two lines of evidence in this case. One, that people that uh, has uh, children live longer. And the second one, that most health disorders are connected with, in, with the infertility. If you look parameters of the sperm of people suffering from many um, disease like uh, diabetes, uh, hypertension, most of them have, are, have even uh, strong problems with infertility. Look at this amazing picture. This is the picture in uh, here. You see the, the sperm of a healthy person. And in this other one, you see the sperm of a diabetic patient. It's completely different, the structure. And all of you knows that it's really important to have a, a, a good structure of the sperm for a good procreation. In conclusion, this paper is uh, saying that uh, it's uh, too early to think about the sperm as uh, a parameters of our health. But maybe in the future, with the development of uh, some things like proteomics, like uh, um, transcriptosomic, and like this, maybe in the future we could use these parameters. And this last sentence about proteomics, it will be um, something to keep in mind because at the end of my presentation, I will talk about this as well. Let's start talking about male infertility. Which is the size of the problem? What we are talking about? The size of the problem is really huge. 80 millions of couples worldwide suffering male infertility. The reasons are so many. If you, you can start from daily stress, drugs abuse, lifestyle, advancing ages, all of these can be problems related with infertility. About 15% of couples suffer for, for infertility and 50% depends on male. This is what European guidelines are confirming to us. Which are the causes of male infertility? Do we have enough causes? Yes, we have really so many causes of male infertility. And even if we have so many causes of male infertility, still 30% of these causes are unknown. So 30% of people suffering from male infertility are classified as idiopathic infertility. So this is the big issue that we have to deal with. On the other side, talking on known causes of fertility, we have the varicocele as the first cause of male infertility. And then there are all the genetical, uh, gynecologic, um, um, endocrinological causes that we will talk later. In this picture, it's e really easy to understand like uh, disease and lifestyle and all what we do is related with the male fertility because the sperm is something that is suffering immediately from something that is changing our good life. Diagnosis. 
it's easy to make a diagnosis. So we understood that we have so many causes that the problem is very big, but are we able to do a good diagnosis of male fertility? The reply is yes and no, because from one side, we have something that is really easy to perform, that is the classical semen analysis. The semen analysis is uh, good for an important routine diagnosis, but unfortunately, it fails to detect any abnormality. So it's something that you have to do, but won't give you all the answers that you are asking. We have different kind of uh, evaluation of the sperm. Um, the last version of the WHO guidelines of 2010 are more complete and are including so many quality control, quality insurance. They are looking at the sperm morphology, so it's more complete, but still we are far from having really good information from the semen analysis. This is what, we, what changed. If you look at 1980, on the first version of the WHO manual and the last, the fifth of 2010, you see a very big changes in the parameters included. This is because uh, many years ago we were more fertile, now we are less fertile, and uh, this is something that we really have to keep in mind because of the reasons that I told you before. Endocrine evaluation is something really important as well, because so many endocrine disorders are related to male infertility. So making a, an evaluation of all the hormones, testosterone, LH, FSH, PRL, and inhibin, it's really fundamental to exclude the endocrine part of the male infertility. On the other side, the genetical disorders, because if you make a correct evaluation of a chromosomal aneuploidy abnormality, Y chromosome microdilations, and the fibro cystic fibrosis gene, this allows you to exclude the genetical causes of male fer infertility. Other tests, we are really full of tests. I put on the first the assessment of the reactive oxygen species because they are really important because um, what we will talk later is about uh, ROS. And even the sperm chromatin integrity is really important. DNA fragmentation, all of you knows that is one of the most important tests that we do uh, nowadays, but even these are still lacking the final answers to the causes of male infertility. Remember that still 30% are idiopathic causes. The varicocele issue. I told you before that uh, up to 15% of male infertility causes are varicocele. So varicocele is something that we have really to t take in mind. But we still have so many answers to give to this problem. Is there a relationship between varicocele and infertility? Are we sure about this? Treating varicocele can improve fertility? So let's try to, uh, to reply to these two questions. The first question, if there is a relationship, if we look at, at this Cochrane review of 2003, they conclude that we did not find sufficient evidence to conclude that treatment of clinical varicocele in couples with male subfertility improves the likelihood of conception. So if we look at this, they are told, telling us that almost is useless to treat varicocele because they don't give us the and they don't give us the chance to improve our fertility. Later in 2006, there is uh, something more easy in which they are saying that um, yes, it's true that we not we don't have the evidence that treating varicocele can help the fertility, but we can even not say that not treating don't give us good fertility. 2011, there is something more on the side of varicocele. They are analyzing people making the varicocele repair and they are looking that the, there is a, a difference in the pregnancy rate between who was treated and who was not treated. And this is statistically significant. There is even this uh, important meta-analysis of 2011 on fertility and sterility that is almost confirming that uh, Analyzing with a really um, exclusion of not good uh, papers, so including just five good papers, at the end we can conclude that there is an evidence in favor of treating male um, varicocele because it can give us more chance on pregnancy. And last but not least, this paper of really recent of 2016, in which they are dividing because we have a different type of varicocele, not only the grade of varicocele, but even the 
evidence of the sperm because you can have a varicocele with the normal zoospermic parameters and you can have a varicocele with not normal parameters. So this group divided patients in accordance with the quality of the sperm. So we have a subclinical varicocele, normal zoospermic clinical varicocele and asteno oligospermic clinical varicocele. And the results are quite impressive because they just treated the patients having uh, alterations on the sperm. And what they found that uh, regarding the DNA fragmentation index, uh, that is one of the most important parameters, we have uh, a statistically significant difference between before and after the treatment. So again in favor. But what this paper is telling us again is that uh, on the other side, people that have normal zoospermic parameters, even if they have varicocele, they shouldn't be treated because you won't reach any good results, any increase in the fertility in these cases. In fact, if we look at the latest European guidelines of urology on the treatment of varicocele, we have some evidence. First of all, that the testicular damage is often related to varicocele. There is a significant uh, overtreatment risk because we are treating too many varicocele, but varicocele repair is effective in men with oligospermia. So in conclusion, what the guidelines told to us that we have to treat varicocele in adolescent that having problems with the testicular growth. Do not treat varicocele if uh, the parameters of the sperm are good and treat varicocele if you are suffering from uh, any oligo teratozoospermic parameters in the man. So this is what they are concluding. And the second point is the correct way of treat varicocele because you know we have uh, maybe more than 10 different ways of treat varicocele mainly divided in two topic the surgical repair and their and then radiological repair. So uh, the surgical repair, it's, uh, it's a good uh, approach, but even the radiology approach is good. But this um, report, uh, they conclude almost that uh, it's better to apply for a surgical repair and inside the surgical repair approach, the best one is the, uh, the microsurgical with the magnific magnification and with the sparing of the lymphatic vessels. This will help you having uh, more results and helps you having less side effects. In fact, even the guidelines, they arrive at the conclusion that, that the sclerotherapy and embolization are good, but they have uh, up to 9% of recurrence complication, while the microsurgical ligation have really low side effects and really low recurrences that are up to 4%. So it should be the best way to treat the varicocele. Moving from another topic, we are, we, we are thinking about oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is really important for two reasons. First of all, because varicocele is uh, often related to an increase of oxidative stress. So maybe treating varicocele, you can have a better um, an, a, a decrease in oxidative stress. Plus, oxidative stress could be the reply of all the idiopathic causes of male infertility to whom we don't have the reply. Oxidative stress can make damages at all level of the of the spermatozoa because uh, all of you knows that uh, the spermatozoa are made of uh, head, midsection, and tail. So oxidative stress is able to act at different points, making uh, damages to the DNA of the of the sperm, making uh, damage to the natural defenses, and even to the sperm tail. All of these parts of the sperm are really important for the for the for the mm, good quality of the semen. So you have to think about the reactive oxygen species like the pinballs that bounce against the, the sperm. Every time that these pinballs bound this sperm, they can create a damage. But talking like this is not uh, completely correct because a reactive oxygen species must respect a correct balance because uh, you can say that uh, too much reactive oxygen species create damages, but on the other side, a small quantity of ROS are needed for the sperm formation and for the sperm maturation. So we say that uh, we can have a membrane damage, instability, till the cell 
Death, moderately elevated, bring to sperm immobilization. When the concentration is really high, we have the complete cell death. But even the mitochondrial function can, be, can receive an, a damage from the reactive oxygen species. The mitochondria, all of you know, that are related to the, all the energies, uh, to the energetic metabolism of the sperm. So even the mitochondrial function must be kept really good. And this is why we understood that the oxidative stress must keep a correct balance, not too less, not too much. And maybe the antioxidants could be the answer to keep this correct balance between production and clearance of the reactive oxygen species. And what we can notice with the, um, with the upcoming study is that maybe this could, could be one of the answer. Carnitins. Carnitins, we heard from uh, my colleague that they are, can help in so many pathways and even in male fertility can give us a good answer because carnitins can act on different parts of the sperm and on the fertility. So first of all, they bring energy into the cells and for obtaining a good spermatozoa quality, the energy is fundamental. But even in removing toxins, so this is again over the good balance between reactive oxygen species quantity. So you, on one side, you bring energy into the cells, and on the other, you remove toxin from the cells. This helps you even in the maturation that happen in the epididymal lumen, because you know the sperm, one is mature, they need even the acrosomal reaction, and even the capacitation, and even for these two other uh, main things, uh, the carnitins can give you and help. What literature is telling to us? If we start from 2005, this is an interesting paper. It's not a big because it's just 60 patients, but it's interesting because they made an association between L-carnitine and acetyl L-carnitine in comparison with placebo. And what they saw at the end of six months of therapy is that there is a, an increase in all the sperm parameters and in particular in the sperm forward motility. This is the percentage difference. If we look between placebo, LC, ALC and uh, the association of the two carnitines, you see that there is uh, an increase in up to 70%. So it seems that the results are really good. And it seems better that the um, ALC is the best element acting on this. Even the LC can give you some advantages. But if you compare group one, that is uh, ALC plus LC or ALC alone, it obtained better results than LC alone. So ALC, it seems to have better results in comparison with LC. And even pregnancy rate, this, is was, this was not an end point of this study. But at the end of the study, the authors noticed that there were nine pregnancies out of 12 cured in treated patients. And seven was in the group with the ALC. So this is a, a secondary endpoint, but is important as well. This is a meta-analysis. This is more recent, it is 2007. And uh, making a, a correct selection, selection of the papers and of the article on the carnitines, even in this meta-analysis, they conclude that regarding uh, motility, morphology, and concentration, almost all the papers are in favor of the treatment with carnitines. And even the last figure, the figure three, reports that the morphology, so the atypical forms of the sperm, decrease in an important way. But what is important is not to know the morphology, the concentration. What people want is the pregnancy. And even looking at the pregnancy rate, there is a statistically significant results in favor of the treatment with carnitines. This is why if we look at something more recent, this is the last important paper on um, carnitines in association with varicocele. Because as we understood that varicocele is able to create an increase in reactive oxygen species and carnitines could be the solution, that they could decrease the quantity of reactive oxygen species. Even in this population, this is not a big population, but it is a population that has varicocele grade one. So really easy varicocele. So this, this helps us to understand, first of all, that varicocele grade one already is able to create damages. 
and then that DNA fragmentation, because the DNA fragmentation, as you see here, there is a statistically significant difference between treated and untreated patients. So again, the, we have something in favor of the treatment with carnitins. This is a, a bit a provocatory paper, and this is why I want to present you, because um, we have idiopathic infertility. We don't know what to do. We almost have just two chance because we have therapy with uh, antioxidants and therapy with uh, endocrinological items. So what to do is correct to treat this. In general, we can say that oral antioxidant results in a significant increase in the live birth rate compared with control treatment. So by the end, even this uh, provocative paper is concluding that we, there are some evidence of treating with antioxidants. Unfortunately, Still today, we don't have the final concluding evidence that is in favor of any pharmaceutical treatment and nutraceutical treatment in idiopathic fertility. Because if you look at the conclusion of the guidelines of 2017, no clear recommendation can be done for treatment with gonadotropin, so endocrinological therapy, anti-estrogens and antioxidant even for a subset of patients. So even if we have so many evidence, the guidelines still cannot give us final conclusion. And at the end of my presentation, I would like to present our experience, because um, which is the first problem of uh, treating patients with antioxidants? Before starting this paper, I make a, a review of the literature, and what I noticed is that there is a almost a mess, because uh, not so many study, the group is uh, too small, no control group, no placebo, so it's difficult to trace a final conclusion. When uh, you come to me and you tell me do antioxidant, yes, I say yes, it's okay, but give me the evidence that we can have an action of these products. This is why we published 2018, after almost four years of working, because the protocol was written in 2013. Why so, so long time, almost five years? Because we really applied strict criteria, strict items to obtain results that uh, are real and that, that are, in our opinion, good to understand. So we used this randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study and we wanted to evaluate the effect of supplementations over the placebo, and we divided even the population between who was suffering from varicocele and who was not suffering from varicocele. Treatment was of six months, and we evaluated the sperm at the beginning and at the end of the uh, therapy. One of four patients, we asked to the statistician which was the correct number to obtain significant uh, results, divided between varicocele and non-varicocele, and then Again, placebo and supplementation groups. The results are quite impressive because looking at all the main parameters, motility, concentration, and count, the, here there is the difference between, vari, between uh, in, altogether varicocele and non-varicocele, and here when you divide between varicocele and non-varicocele. So in all the parameters, we obtain a statistically significant difference between treatment and placebo group. And this difference is even more impressive if you look at the varicocele patients. So as we think that varicocele is able maybe to create more reactive oxygen species production, maybe in this case uh, with the antioxidant we can obtain better results. This is uh, uh, the difference between uh, varicocele and without varicocele. As you can see, almost all the parameters evaluated, the concentration count, motility, and even the, uh, the morphology that is uh, present on the, on the paper, all of these parameters are statistically significant between uh, treatment and between placebo. As a secondary endpoint, the pregnancy rate. All of you know that uh, you can tell me that you have a perfect sperm, but if you don't obtain a pregnancy, it's almost useless. So even the pregnancy rate was uh, interesting because we, uh, we had 12 pregnancies in the six-month follow-up period. Ten, they occurred in the proxied patients. Nine was for non-varicocele, the one was with people suffering from varicocele. Of the two pregnancies occurred in placebo patients, um, one, it became a, an absorption. So this is the secondary endpoint. 
exactly because we obtained these good results, we wanted to continue with this research. And it's for this reason that uh, the main problem of our study was uh, the missing of the evaluation of the DNA fragmentation. So in order to continue our evaluation, we, we in February 2018, so one month ago, we wrote the new protocol that is evaluating the new formulation of the, of the proxid and is evaluating on the other side what will change in the DNA fragmentation. This is the schedule of our protocol. So we start in 2018, then we will proceed with the ethical committee approval. We will start with the enrollment and we expect to have the final results by September 2019 because we want to obtain again um, results that are really uh, well conducted and are really and are real. This is because, uh, remember that for any drugs, the clinical efficacy of any natural compounds must be demonstrated by double-blind placebo-controlled trials. Last part of my presentation is just a provocation, is just a, uh, a future perspective, it's just to tell you what we can do and what we will do in the future, maybe to help us to understand better the male infertility and the contraception and these items. Proteomics. Proteomics maybe will be the answer to all of our questions. What is proteomics? Proteomics is the study of the, of the proteins, and in particular both in the qualitative and quantitative analysis of them. And um, because you know that uh, considering just the DNA sequencing, that alone answer really few questions. And maybe if we look at the structure of the proteins, maybe we will receive more uh, reply to our question. And in the field of the sperm cell biology, the identification of wide range of proteins uh, and all the mechanisms that will regulate the fertility and the infertility will help us giving this reply. Look at this. This is a, a map of the list of proteins localized in the different regions of spermatozoa. So we are already doing something with the proteomics. We are already making a map of the proteins. And um, we understood that uh, is different the proteins that are related in the acrosome and the head part of the sperm, and even on the mid piece on the tail, even because they are related to different uh, functions. So if you think at the acrosome and the head, it is related with the um, acrosome reaction and capacitation, while the other part is related with the energy metabolism and with the uh, spermatozoa oocyte interaction. And uh, Starting from this, the conclusion is that comparison of data from the proteome and transcriptome provides a reliable basis to evaluate the exact mechanism of the respective protein that controls fertility, infertility, and contraception. We are living in the omics area, so maybe the omics will give you the answer on what we are still not knowing. Thank you.